As we continue going south on Military Street, uh, looking at some of the homes that are still there, and some of the uh, occupants that were in that home over the 100 year period that are probably there, uh, we come to this next house that was right next to the Davidson house. It's pretty hard to see when you're dependent on Google because of all the trees, but here's a little better picture here. Folks of my generation normally remember this building as the Fortune and Business College. I know my wife attended there as well. Before it was a business college, it was a home. Over the decades, it was a home to two very uh, important businessmen in Fortune. The first prominent businessman that was a resident of this home was John W. Thompson, Jr. He was a steamboat agent and forwarder, which just basically means that he was an agent for these different companies that you see here of supplying the ship's coal, along with other services. Down below you can see it says hard, soft, blacksmith coal, lubricating and kerosene oils, kerosene and fish barrels, hay, oats, feed, cement, plaster, etc. It says the office and dock is the foot of Sarnia Street. Now, most of you don't know where the foot of Sarnia Street is because, well, Sarnia Street isn't there anymore. But let me show you where it was. Looking at this Google map, you can see uh, the Black River down below at the bottom and the St. Clair River at the right. And you see Grand River uh, at the very top of the screen and Quay Street at the bottom. The red line is where Sarnia Street was. If you see, it runs the same way as Grand River and uh, pretty much uh, Quay, although Quay goes at an angle. And uh, Sarnia Street was closer to Grand River than it was to Quay. Sarnia Street ran all the way from Michigan Street to Merchant Street. At the very foot of that red line it was Merchant Street and the yellow rectangle you see there, that is where uh, J.W. Thompson had his coal company that he serviced all the ships that came into port there. This map from 1911 gives you a little better idea. You can see Sarnia Street marked quite clearly on this map uh, where the red line is. And you can see uh, where the coal company is uh, that's surrounded by the uh, yellow rectangle. And if you look uh, carefully, if we just tip this over on its end, you'll be able to see the name of the coal company is listed there as well, J.W. Thompson Company. There were at least two coal companies on St. Clair River and one coal company on Black River, as far as I know anyway, there could be more. But uh, loading those ships was quite primitive, as you can see by this photograph here. Later on, John Thompson would go on to become the secretary and treasurer of the Harrington Hotel Company. The Thompson family resided in this home here from the late 1800s into, oh, as far as the 1920s, I believe. The house sat vacant for a couple of years, and then Elmer J. Ottaway, his wife Ruth, and their family moved in, uh, all about 1928, I believe. Uh, Mr. Ottaway was the president of the Times Herald Company. At that time, the Times Herald was a fairly new building. It was over there uh, on 6th Street, uh, well, right about here today. Uh, also, he was the president of the Herald Printing Company, and he was the vice president of the U.S. Savings Bank. Many of my generation remember that on the northwest corner of Military and Water Street, there used to be a very uh, high building, which was the People's Bank. It was probably the highest uh, building, uh, closest thing that we had to a skyscraper in Port Jern back uh, when I was a boy. And uh, originally started out as the Measle Company, which was uh, a dry goods type company. And later on it became the People's Bank, but in between it was the United States Savings Bank. And this is uh, where Mr. Ottaway was Vice President. And later, uh, as you can see from this uh, document here, he was also one of the directors. 
So you can see this home has had some history behind it. I was going to close this segment of my video with the autoways and in this home and the history. But if you research long enough, you always find a couple more jewels that you just want to share. And that's what I found. So let me share them with you. Let me start this way. Once about a time, there wasn't just one paper in Port Huron. There were many, as you can see here. Notice there is no Port Huron Times Herald in this list. Mr. Ottaway's contribution to the newspapers of Port Huron was more than just being president of the Times Herald. It was because of Mr. Ottaway and a man by the name of Louis uh, Wheel that the Times Herald would even come into existence. In the year 1900, Mr. Ottaway and Mr. Wheel decided to have a brand new paper in Port Huron called the Daily Herald. The two gentlemen had purchased the two papers that you see here outlined in the red. The first being the Sunday Herald. The second being the X-Rays paper. A very unusual name for a newspaper. The office of the Daily Herald was located at 928 6th Street, which is just behind the old post office or federal building. And as we zoom in here, you can see uh, their signage on the side of the building. Uh, the Daily Herald, the Sunday Herald, the German Herald. So it would seem at some point they took control of the German Herald paper as well. In 1907, the Daily Herald moved to the White Building that was located on Water Street right across from the old post office. And they took up the entire first floor and the basement as well. It was leased jointly by the Daily Herald Company and the Herald Printing Company that we mentioned earlier in this video. Soon there were only two daily papers in uh, Port Huron. The first one being the Port Huron Daily Times and of course the second being the Daily Herald. Port Huron which saw at least 20 newspapers come and go during the 1800s. Essentially became a one newspaper town in 1910 when the Daily Herald a decade-old upstart, bought the Times, which dated to 1869. The newspaper consolidated as a Port Huron Times Herald. And so the main paper in Port Huron, the Port Huron Times Herald, was born. The Times Herald used to have a hyphen in between it, but that was dropped later on. The publishers ran two separate papers independent of each other for a short time. One was a morning paper and then one would be in the afternoon, but eventually they were consolidated into one paper. Mr. Ottaway was the president of the company and business manager of the paper. And Mr. Will was secretary and treasurer of the company and he was the editor of the paper. He brought a man by the name of uh, Mr. Sherman, Lauren Sherman, over from the Times uh, to be the editorial writer for the paper, but he had no share in its management, although he did own some stock. That stock was eventually bought out by Ottaway and Wheel, and so they owned the paper entirely uh, between the two men. And speaking of stock, here's a photograph of some early stock that was issued. The stock was uh, signed by officers of the Times Herald. You can see here Herbert Will, and then you can also see E.J. Ottaway. Now you're wondering, haven't we been talking about Lewis Will? Yeah, where's Herbert come in? Well, I'm glad you asked, let me tell you. You'll have to bear with me because we're going to go off on a little bit of a tangent here. I'm assuming that Herbert Will was uh, related to Lewis, although uh, I don't think he was his son. He'd been, uh, much to you uh, owe to be his son at that point in time. And you can see by this article here that he had a very promising newspaper career. But the only reason I'm talking about Herbert at all is not because of his newspaper career, it's because of what he did after the newspaper. And that was he got into the movie house business, or the theater business in Port Huron. And I thought this uh, article here was very interesting and very telling. Let's take a look at it. It starts off by saying Mr. Wheel uh, purchased the Maxim and Bijou Theaters in Port Huron. Now the uh, Maxim Theater that you see here was located on the uh, military, on the corner behind the military. And the Bijou was really a, a forerunner of the Riviera Theater, which was on 
uh, Grand River and Michigan Street. The article also says that he already owns every theater in Port Huron, the Majestic and of course the family. Uh, and then in this next clip we'll, uh, we'll see a couple other uh, movie houses that he owned as well. In this article here, uh, it says he sold the whole kit and caboodle, all his theaters, uh, which also included the Regent and American theaters, uh, which wasn't mentioned before, so he was buying them up. It goes on to say the reason that he was selling these uh, theaters that he already owned was that he's going to uh, have a brand new theater, a seating capacity of 2,000. And it says that the name of this uh, new theater would be selected through the medium of a newspaper contest, which is kind of interesting. I would have to assume that this new theater was the Desmond Theater. This is another article taken from the moving picture world uh, from 1919. It basically talks about the same thing, but it does put a price tag on the theater of $150,000. And you can read this at your leisure. Uh, it might be interesting for some of you uh, historians out there. It kind of gives you the seating, uh, how much seating each uh, theater had, which I thought was kind of interesting. Let's get back to Mr. Wheel and Mr. Ottaway. The paper business wasn't the only venture that these two men went together on. He started a new radio station called WTTH, which many from my generation will remember. The TTH part of the call letters is actually standing for the Times Herald, TTH. Later this would become WPHM. The two had formed quite a partnership over the years. They became friends when they were working for the Detroit Free Press together. They served together on the staff of the Detroit Free Press, uh, where Will was a uh, police reporter and Ottaway was the city editor. Will was on the staff of the Free, Free Press uh, two years. Previously, he was a police reporter on the old Detroit Tribune. Not only were they friends, not only were they partners, but they were also neighbors. As you can tell from the satellite view, uh, the Ottaway house was on the left there on the west side of military and the wheel house was on the right the east side of military and he lived uh, just kitty corner from the Ottaway house they lived in this home right here the one with the turret here's a little better view of it and we'll look at this home and a couple other homes that uh, mr wheel owned as well we'll get a closer look at the man himself i think you'll find it very interesting i know i did but we'll have to wait until the next video.